You're listening to The Great Simplification with Nate Hagens. That's me. On this show, we try to explore and simplify what's happening with energy, the economy, the environment, and our society. Together with scientists, experts, and leaders, this show is about understanding the bird's eye view of how everything fits together, where we go from here, and what we can do about it as a society and as individuals. This week, we speak with Timote Parik. Tim is a social scientist and ecological economist originally from Versailles, France, now teaching at Lund University in Sweden. Tim has a PhD in economics specializing in degrowth, and he's written numerous books and frequently blogs on the issues with green growth and energy and material decoupling. Tim is a passionate, bright young man who I'm pleased to welcome to this podcast. In today's conversation, Tim and I discuss why infinite growth of any kind is simply impossible, and we define and unpack what degrowth is, what it looks like, how the path to degrowth may unfold, and what are the social and physical obstacles between here and there. Here is Timote Parik. You are quite young to understand all this stuff. When I was your age, I was watching Love Boat and Fantasy Island and not remotely thinking about these things other than my love for animals. What was the eye opener for you as to why the current economic system is not sustainable and what sent you down the path that we're going to talk about today? For me, I was studying economics, absolutely unaware of anything having to do with the climate, the environment, biodiversity, all of that was really just for me completely disconnected from our daily life, both in practice and in theory. And I started to study economics and I was sent to Sweden for, you know, one of those Erasmus exchange. And then I I took a a class in uh, sustainable development and there was some, so I, I get confronted to very terrifying numbers. And then it didn't really square with what I've learned at university. I was like, that's like, like you discovering like the entire thing you thought was the world was actually only a small part of the iceberg. And now they're showing you the other part. And that's the ugly part, the like being burned (laughs) kind of part. And you're like freaking out. So that's when I started to challenge the the kind of economics I was taught. And I told myself, okay, uh, learning economics is going to be a a more difficult journey than I thought. And then you ended up getting your PhD on the link between energy and the economy, yes? Well, even more than that, the link between the economy and the rest of the living world. Because when I study the biophysical metabolism of an economy, so we look at energy, but also materials. So these are the two big flows, but then they translate into a number of things. So the, the energy you find in a dead barrel of oil is not the same energy being spent by bees when they pollinate your crop. I mean, both are energies, but they're in a very different manner. Like same thing, the, the material, the lithium you, you're going to find in the ground is not going to be the same material as the solid waste you're going to be picking up in a pond. So physically, it's all energy and matter, but biologically it takes a variety of forms. And of course, the the economy is transforming these. We're turning some of these clean, nice, useful energy forms of energy and materials, and we're transforming them and putting them in other places. And sometimes that creates a bunch of problems. So that... My PhD was not only on this, because this is really the starting point of ecological economics. So meaning this school of economics that look at the economy as embedded in the biosphere. When you start to look at the economy as embedded in the biosphere, where you realize that the idea of endless economic growth, producing and consuming more and more every year, like that's going to be very difficult to hold against the nature that is finite. So that what brought me to study economic growth from this bioeconomic called perspective, and then to also study, and that the main topic of my thesis, the counter mechanism. So the idea of degrowth, putting a macroeconomy on a diet uh, from a biophysical perspective, but so much more on the social perspective. 
I'm really looking forward to this conversation because in some ways it's like talking to a younger, albeit more handsome version <laughs> of myself. <laughs> You're too kind. I want to have you do most of the talking, but we have a lot to cover and I'll chime in uh, on my opinions of this stuff. I mean, you and I have only spoken once or twice, but when I read your tweets and I see your podcast, we're really following a similar path. So I'd like you to say in your own words, we're going to talk about green growth and degrowth and the link between energy and the economy and, and all these things. So, so let's get started. What is the issue with green growth? Why won't it work and why are people so wrapped up? up with the appeal of, of green growth? Well, I mean, before even asking if it works, a strategy as an option, we need to look at the past and being like, what did we manage to green? So that's usually the first step in that discussion. Did we manage to somehow green not only our growth, but just our economic activity in general? So not only the extra bit that you've produced and consumed extra from last year, but just your entirety of the economy. And when we look at the empirical data we have on green growth, we see that some countries have managed to green some of their activities, usually a small portion, usually because they've just uh, delocalized. So they've you know, exported their most polluting productions in other countries at the trans as they transition to service economies. But there's been a tiny bit of greening, but that is very small. And since in the same time, economies have gotten so much bigger. All of those efficiency gains have been just swallowed and counterbalanced by increase in volume. So that's what we call the, the rebound effect. But what is green growth? That would be that we continue to grow our economies with less negative environmental impact or even an environmental improvement. So there are two kinds. Green growth is linked to the concept of decoupling. So decoupling, or you could say delinking, is the idea of detaching the growth of GDP, one indicator of economic activity, and the variation in environmental pressures. So there are many of them, let's take, for example, carbon emissions. So green growth would be increasing your GDP and decreasing your carbon emissions. That economists would call that absolute decoupling compared to relative decoupling, which is you increase your GDP, you decrease your, let's say you slow down the increase of your emissions. So you're getting relatively more efficient, but that's what I've described before. Since you're producing so much more, the few percent you manage to save every year, they're just being swallowed by extra production. So most countries in the world, they've been in that situation of relative decoupling. They invest in eco-innovation, they manage to implement certain forms of of sufficiency at the consumption level. But at the end of the day, because the rhythm of production increases so fast, that is not enough to reduce total footprint. So when we're talking about green growth, I mean, the goal at the end of the day is not just to green growth. The goal is to have a green economy. So what is a green economy? It's a, an economy that is sustainable. So it's an economy that is just uh, abiding to specific ecological budgets. You may have heard of planetary boundaries. So that's a framework often used by scientists developed at the end of the 2000s at the Stockholm Resilience Center in Sweden, where they represent uh, the global economy as being just limited by nine ecological ceilings. So climate change is a famous one. There's also biodiversity, the use of water, and many others. And those are giving us like boundaries we should not cross. So for me, a sustainable economy is an economy that is just using extracting resources like they do in nature and rejecting pollutions like any economy do, but at a pace and at a volume that is not threatening the health of ecosystems. So right now, the priority is for us to get our economy that are now just at the level where they're not sustainable to this level that is sustainable. So for me, like the issue of green growth is very small because that's only talking about the extra production we'll be having from one year to the next. But the broader question is today we already have a significant volume of production and consumption every year, even just, you know, if the economy remains at a steady state. And even that steady state is far from being sustainable. So one issue is how do we make sure that everything else we produce from now is as green as possible? The other issue is also asking the tough question of the scale of your economy. Can this scale be maintained in time? 
that's why I have a problem with the word sustainable. I think what we're shooting for is something more or significantly more sustainable than we have now. But to be truly sustainable, as in it can be sustained without environmental impact, the scale of the economy would have to be vastly smaller than today's, yes? Absolutely. We're used to talk about a carbon budget. Now people know. So a carbon budget is limited. It's a limited number of tons of carbon you can emit if you don't want to cross dangerous boundary of global warming. But for every single use of a resource, you have a similar budget. So a water budget, a biomass budget, a metal budget, you know, all of these, anything that having to do with nature, you have to follow its own pace. It's like it imposing a speed limits on economic activity. So when you're doing ecological economics, you have to be, okay, what is the biophysical budget that I have? That's the first question where you define the scale, the economy. And then you can ask yourself a bunch of other questions after what do we produce? How do we produce it? And all of that. But that scale issue is extremely important, especially in a world that is already in a state of a shoot. The problem with that state of a shoot is that we are living in a world where poverty remain, where there is significant production and consumption that will be needed in the global south. So that put, let's say, an extra pressure for the global north to be like, okay, not only do we need to be sustainable, that's nice for us, but we need to minimize the use of natural resources so we can maximize, create as much space as possible for prosperity in the regions of the world that will need more energy and materials. So let's get back to the decoupling question. Many international economic forecasts like the International Energy Agency, BP, the UN, have forecasts for continued economic growth through mid-century, through 2050, 2040, 2050. And they all are showing a growth in energy consumption, but they're showing that GDP will grow much faster than energy consumption. So that would imply a decoupling of economic growth and energy use. What, what do you think about that? In my research, I mean, I call that a GDP-led decoupling. So let's say it's GDP that is rising so fast and so fast, and maybe your energy consumption is just increasing a tiny bit. If you're a climatologist, that's not what you want. If, I mean, we want to reduce absolute impact. So we know we need to you know, reduce emissions. So all of these projections, the best they manage is a stabilization of our emissions or a very slight decrease, like something in the realm of one, two, three percent per year, where we know scientists tell us that, you know, stick to the 1.5 degree climate threshold. We're rather aiming for double dig digits reductions yearly in high income countries. So that's why for me, that brings me with the inevitability of degrowth. We'll see later that there are many good reasons of doing that. And that actually it's a nice opportunity to reorganize our economy so it functions better. But even if that wasn't the case, we would have to do it because there's just no way we can maintain that's the thing. The longer you maintain a state of overshoot, ecological overshoot, the more you're taking the risk of degrading ecological eco ecosystems, degrading ecosystems. The more you degrade ecosystems, the less they produce resources for you. So the more your budgets are actually shrinking. So the more you're in overshoot. And so the more you go and degrade ecosystems. And at the end of these cycles, you get dead oceans, you know, disappear, disappearance of bees and biodiversity loss, uh, heat, the heat waves we're witnessing now, soil, the loss of soil fertility, all these kind of stuff that become extremely problematic uh, for us to do the kind of things that maintain us alive, like growing food and just uh, living in cities where it's not 40 degrees. The challenge is, though, that we're not optimizing for ecosystem health and reducing the impact of overshoot. We're optimizing for the energy metabolism that grows our financial economy, which is tethered to an energy economy. So before we get into what we should do or what is likely to happen, I'm just asking you the feasibility just from a biophysical perspective of energy and GDP decoupling. I, I know from prior data that globally, the 
the correlation historically has been around 0.993. Every one unit of new GDP, we've used 0.993 units of new energy. That's been declining a little bit in the last decade, and maybe you could speak to the reasons why. But I, I, I want you to just articulate the best you can the relationship between energy and GDP historically and in the future. I'm going to propose a new start for this. Like, let's think about what GDP is. I mean, most people don't know it's calculated. It's a very abstract indicator. But at the end of the day, it's supposed to be an estimation of production and consumption, right? So especially an indicator of production, so what an economy produces. In fact, GDP is closer to an indicator of economic agitation. So it measures, you know, the, the activity of the monetary activity of an economy. When you see this, like when you hear production, when you hear activity, that means energy. You don't have energy. There's, you know, there's Steve Keen that said that the difference between a, a worker without an energy is a cadaver and a machine without energy is a sculpture. So I think you could agree on a number of social conventions on how to measure GDP and try to make it like more and more abstract so that it disguises that the fact that an economy uses natural resources. But at the end of the day, I think you cannot get away from the fact that any single human activity more or less directly relies on energy. And so far, as you said, historically, since the dawn of the industrial revolution, that has been fossil energy. So that has been like, you know, this boom of very clean, very powerful energy source that has just allowed us to do many things, to agitate in a way we could not agitate before. But that was a bit of a one shot. So now if we have to do away with fossil energy, where are we going to find the energy to agitate ourselves? A question Europe is asking themselves right now. Exactly. So now it's it's the first time I'm talking from the, the French context where fossil companies, the government, they're appealing, they're just begging their citizens to go for sufficiency. The kind of policies that for decades they've been saying it's useless because we just need to clean production and then we'll have an unlimited bounty of just clean energy. Now we realize that most of the economy still functions because of fossil fuel. And when that tap runs out, there's no other solution. Like we have to consume less of it. And I'm like, now people are experiencing like one of the aspects of degrowth, the fact that like with less energy available, well, that means we'll have to make certain choices. Do we want to use that energy to fabricate SUVs and fly private jets? Do we want to keep that energy to you know, keep hospital runnings uh, or just to do anything else? Do we want to keep that energy for people in France or just save most of that energy for the building of vital infrastructure in the global south? Limited energy then means we have to choose. Whereas before, in the, the fantasy of growth and especially of green growth, we didn't have to choose. Unbonded energy and forever increasing levels of production for everything. So you were widely known as a degrowth scholar. You're the first person I've had on this uh, podcast to talk about degrowth. So could you just give a couple minute overview of what is degrowth and can we keep our current metrics of economic progress and still degrow? Mm. Break it out for us. So I'm, I'm going to give you two definitions because as you said, I'm a degrowth scholar. So I mean, I'm an ecological economist, so I study the interaction between the economy and nature, and I study that degrowth as a phenomenon. But degrowth is both a concrete phenomenon, which I will soon describe, and also a school of thought in the sense of, you know, people talk about a degrowth society. So meaning a society that has embraced some kind of values and principles in the same way that people talk about that an eco-socialist society or post-capitalist societies, all these kind of things. So now we need to, de degrowth is this very broad paradigm uh, integrating a lot of values and principles that have been developing in the last two decades that lead people to advocate for, and now that's now I'm giving you the definition of phenomenon that is degrowth, a downscaling of production and consumption. So that the most minimal definition, I'm going to start there, a growing economy, produce and consume more from one year to, to the other. If today the economy is too big, we need to downscale, so smaller economy. And then I'm going to add a few things to make it more precise because now it's, well, it's pretty much, you cannot make the difference between degrowth and collapse or degrowth and recession. So it's a, a downscaling of production and consumption that reduce environmental pressures. 
So that's the first element. We're not doing this for fun. It's like if at the end you downscale your economy, but you keep producing just only private jets and your footprint has not decreased, then what's the point? So downscaling to reduce environmental pressures. And then we add three other elements in a way that is democratic, socially just, and that improve well-being. So the socially just is here because of what I talked before. Countries of various biophysical metabolisms. You get very obese economies in the US and Canada and some parts of Europe that use a lot of energy and material that will need to undergo a very severe degrowth because your de the degrowth your economy needs to go through is proportional to your ecological overshoot. So if you're like Costa Rica and you've just you know overshot one boundary out of nine, then it's fine. You will just have to reduce a tiny bit. That's not going to be drastic. Same thing if we had started degrowth in the 1970s after the, the Meadows report, then it would have been like fairly easy. We would have reduced a few things and then the economy could have remained in a steady state, but we didn't do that. And 50 years later, most high-income countries have overshot big time. So that means big degrowth. So it needs to be done in a way that is socially just, also taking into account not only historical responsibility and the size of your economy, but also the needs of your population. So if you're in a country like France, where in theory, all the infrastructure we have, all the national income we have is sufficient to satisfy all the French people needs, if it were to be split equitably. So here, like growing more is not going to solve poverty or inequality. It's just a matter of distribution. So you know that this country, you know, is just perfect candidate for degrowth. If you look at Madagascar, then we understand that that country has not overshoot their planetary boundaries so that can actually afford to use more energy and more materials. And they should afford that because they need to increase their life expectancy, their levels of education. They need to build all these public services that you need to have a good quality of life. So here, that's how we connect you know, the degrowth in the North to a low sustainable development in the South. And I'm going to add one thing. So the two elements I've talked about, sustainability, I've talked about social justice, but I've added also democracy and well-being. The democratic aspect is has to do with, in a growth economy, companies decide what to produce, investors decide what to expand, and there's not too much of a democratic discussions because we can do everything at the same time, or at least we thought we could with the bounty of fossil energy. But now we realize that we can't anymore and we have to make some choices. Problem is, I mean, to make these choices, we need to put everyone at the table so that these choices come to reflect the needs of everyone. So that's the importance of democracy that is so much more important in an economy that is shrinking than in an economy that is expanding. So that's the first point. And then concerning well-being. It's a diet, not an amputation. So we want to be able to do this while maintaining quality of life. And even more, not only maintaining quality of life, but there could be possibilities, and I can talk a bit more about that later, of just undergoing this massive biophysical diet and in doing that, actually increasing quality of life. So that's, you could say that's the challenge of degrowth. I have like 14 questions. <laughs> go, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I too think that degrowth is coming. Obviously, you're aware of that from watching my videos and, and reading my paper. But I don't think it's going to be a voluntarily, democratically um, governance-based decision, but based on a reconnection of the financial claims versus our underlying energy and material economy. So does the degrowth movement uh, writ large distinguish between voluntary and involuntary degrowth? Yeah, there's this book by a Canadian macroeconomist, Peter Victor, from 2008. And he was making a difference between degrowth by design and degrowth by disaster. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm using different terms. So when I'm talking about the disaster, I'm talking about recession, turning into depression, turning into collapse, because I want to keep degrowth since it has turned in such a value laden concept, just to very precisely describe that transition, which I've described as democratic, socially just, and that improves well-being. But we have to face that fact that today we have economies that stabilize themselves through growth. But we're also experiencing in most high-income countries what economists call a singular stagnation. So a, a, a slowdown 
a generalized slowdown of rates of economic growth. So basically, we've built growth-dependent economies, and now we're running out of growth. And so that brings a whole lot of problem because a growth-based economy that cannot grow enters in recession, and then in depression, cannot finance anything, cannot create new businesses, cannot create jobs, cannot redistribute properly. So it just completely stopped to function. So right now, we're going to get confronted to that. We've had a taste of it during the pandemic. We're getting a taste of it during the Ukrainian war. So now the question is, the earlier we realize that we better just sit down and be like, you know what, let's just make the modification we need to adapt our economy so it can prosper without growth. And in order to prosper without growth, we need to reduce the scale of it. That's the addition. So we need to just undergo that degrowth transition to stabilize the economy at a steady state where we can have actually this well-being economy that can prosper without growth. So what is the possible governance structure that could even conceivably enable a massive degrowth of what you refer to as the obese countries, uh, economically speaking? Because I think individual people can voluntarily go on diets, but cultures do not. Uh, and I think we're seeing that with a rightward shift politically in many countries, including your own. And when when economies were growing, democracy worked. But if economies are shrinking, either voluntarily or involuntarily, how can the democratic governance process inform that? What, what are your thoughts on that? First, I would be a bit hesitant in calling, you know, growth based capitalism we have democratic. Because basically, when you're looking at any economy is making decisions about what to produce and how to produce it. Today, these decisions are being taken by a minority of people that are either you know, the managers of companies or just the shareholders that control the managers of companies. That's a very small minority of people. So they decide what to produce. For example, they decide to keep extracting oil, even though all scientists and now broad consensus has to know that we need to stay at least, you know, 60% of all oil need to stay in the ground if we want to have a serious shot at avoiding climate collapse. They're not doing it because they have no monetary interest in doing that. And because we don't have a democratic mode of production, then it's fine. They don't have to. It's their company. They do whatever they want and they follow their objective, which is to maximize returns to shareholders and their company's profit. So I'm thinking anything we would do better than that would be more democratic. And something as simple as the French Citizen Convention for Climate. So for those of you that haven't followed that, the response of the French government to the Yellow Vest was to form a randomly selected convention of 150 citizens and ask them, well, okay, we've the government has failed to implement convincing climate plans, so you do it. You have access to experts we pay you to take six months to sit down, look at this, give us proposals. We give you people to translate these proposals into laws. And then, you know, we'll just implement it. We can discuss this via referendums, all kind of stuff. That was an unprecedented exercise in, in democracy, I think. And when you look at the 149 policies that came out of that process, if they were to be implemented, I think degrowth would be a consequence of that. So people that have no material interest they don't have shares in, in fossil companies, a random selection of, of people, which with high levels of inequality, statistically is going to include a minority of very rich people that have an interest in keeping the economy growing because that uh, makes them richer. Then people are going to be like, well, if I we reduce production and consumption, if we keep some oil in the ground, anyway, I'm not getting any money out of extracting them, but I'm getting a lot of well-being out of keeping them in the ground because that means I'm go not going to have like, you know, repeated heat waves that my <laughs> children are going to have an habitable planet to live and all that kind of stuff. So I'm imagining now like to make these decisions about what to produce and how to produce it, we need to create pockets of democracy at many different places. That was an example like citizen convention. Of course, you cannot do everything for a citizen convention to decide what kind of choose we're going to produce. But you can make sure that within companies, like it's already the case for cooperatives, you get a diversity of stakeholders that are sitting at the table. You know, how nice would it be in a big company when you're deciding what to produce and how to produce it, that you have people that can represent, you know, ecosystems 
and their state, you have consumers representatives, you have worker representatives, and they bargain. They're like, you will have the engineers being like, guys, I'm sick of this planned obsolescence. Like, honestly, do we really need to make washing machine that crap? And then the shareholders will be like, yeah, but I mean, that's just so nice. Makes so much money. And then they realize they'll vote and they're the only one benefiting from this. The consumers are like, no, that sucks. I don't like my washing machine to break. The engineers like, I don't like to make that. I feel ashamed. And the scientists will tell the environmental scientists will be like, yeah, guys, we need to make things as durable as possible because we're short on materials. And if you were to do this, I think, you know, company by company, we would integrate the social and ecological concern. So that's why for me, democracy is so important. And I'm not saying it's easy, but I don't see any reason, any reason why we could not create all these democratic forums at the level of the neighborhood, at the level of the city, at the level of the company, at the level of a sector, a region, a nation and beyond. Well, first of all, I think there are biophysical momentum processes built in here, and it's not the fault of the corporations as much as it's the laws that have been put in place that the corporations adhere to. Like maximizing profits is our cultural goal, and those are the institutions that are put in place. So, you know, one core question I have for you, and I don't expect you to have a good answer because I don't know anyone that does, <laughs> is what is the choreography that would lead to corporations and society at large pursuing some objective other than maximizing monetary profits tethered to energy, tethered to environmental damage? When you ask people, like, therefore, growth. They're like, yeah, yeah, of course, because they associate it with progress. But if you turn that question around and because growth at the level of economy translate into companies producing more, each of them. And so you're like, okay, to have a growing economy, we need to have for-profit economy, for-profit companies that just, whatever they do, they need from one year to the other to boost their profit because that's the best way we found on how to maximize production. I think 99.9 .9 people in the street would tell you, no, like businesses should not just make money. They should, you know, have a mission and produce useful things. They should care about their workers and their community, this kind of stuff. If that is true, then we realize there's no reason to keep the for-profit private company in existence. So we could just decide that every legally, every single company should have a mission that is concrete in the sense that it's not the abstract pursuit of profit. And that mission, and that's the case, again, for a few cooperatives around the world, they have a mission. That mission is evaluated periodically by a multi-stakeholder board that is looking at, okay, did you manage to satisfy your needs, like your social targets, your ecological targets? Do we need to produce something different? Do we need to produce less? Do we need to use a different technology? So then production would cease to be this kind of accumulative process where you're always trying to sell more, cut cost so that you boost profits. And cutting cost very often means degrading working condition, degrading the quality of product and uh, deteriorating the environment more. So then if you integrate this, we would get a production that is so much more qualitative. And I think that will be in the interest of the great majority of people. It's also resonate with common sense production. I'm always telling this to my students. I mean, look at the things you produce at home. Let it be, you know, a service when you clean your kitchen or when you do gardening or like what kind of mentality do you apply? Do you have this kind of like blind productivity where I'm just, you know, taking care of my kid, just minimizing the time I spend trying to be most efficient? I was like, no. When I'm taking care of my kid, their well-being is number one. Like they are, of course, I don't want to spend like 12 hours, you know, changing a nappy. So I'd, I'd have to be efficient. But somehow, if it comes to just against the well-being of, <laughs> of the baby, then that's, I'm not doing that technique. I'm not choosing that. So the thing is, we apply it every day with our friends, with our family, with our community. So why every single time we just wear a suit? and go to our company, we need to apply a completely different state of mind. It doesn't make sense. So I want people to imagine like the macroeconomy, I mean, is just the aggregation of all our behaviors, but it, it does not transcend. There's nothing magical about it. So in the same way that when you're planning your home economy, you know, you have limited time and you're caring about things and productivity is not everything. At the level of the economy as a whole, it's precisely the same thing, but we tend to forget it. 
because it's easy and because we make decisions that we don't bear the consequences. So you're a fossil fuel company. If I extract extra barrels, I get the money on my bank account this year. And other people in the global South get the negative consequences of global warming. So it's very easy for me to be like, well, that was worth it. I can use that money to send my kids to college. And I feel, you know, I've done a good thing. But if you tie the, if, if you tie it all together, if you have a systemic view, then you realize that actually the activity of a corporation is just following the very much social and biophysical <laughs> rules that uh, an economic activity at, at the community level, or at least it should. Well, one thing that I totally agree with you on is not that I could ever change a nappy, even in 12 hours, but the best <laughs> things in life are free once our basic needs are met. And we're on this treadmill that we're being told and marketed and compelled to consume more every year. And I think more and more people are recognizing that this system is not working, not working for many people and people are scared about the future. So I do agree that making love with your partner and going and playing in the woods with your dog and digging a garden and these things don't require much exosomatic energy and yet they contribute a great deal to our well-being. So how might we shift our society to maximize well-being that isn't tightly correlated with more energy and material consumption? Yeah, I think what you said is fundamental. When all sociological studies we have that ask people during their life and especially at the end of their lives, you know, what made you the happiest? People don't tell you like, oh, my SUV. My connected fridge, that was sweet. No, that uh, like, you know, the people I've been in love with, my family, you know, the, the tree I've planted that is now like super big, the fact that I somehow managed to, you know, build a choir uh, that we we sung for years, you know, all of these, actually, they're, they're going to be talking about what Ehrman Daly was calling like ultimate ends. They're going to be talking about something that is quite immaterial. So of course, in order to do this, you need some materials. So let's say you need a room with a mic to meet and a piano so you can sing with your choir. But you don't need to produce, you know, increase 2% in the growth of piano every year. So right now we're just, if the concept of a well-being economy is precisely this, to just produce the things and then find a way to use them in the way that maximize well-being. I give you a very concrete examples. In France, everyone has a washing machine. You know, you have it in your basement. I suspect that the same in, in the US and many other countries. In Sweden, they share washing machines. So in every apartment in the basement, you have this industrial, very nice quality washing machine. And, you know, you can book a time and you share them. So that's why in Sweden, they use way less washing machines, but they get access to better washing machine. And as soon as there's a problem, you know, it gets fixed by a professional and these things can last for like super long time. So here we're looking at like they maintain the same quality of life concerning washing machine, washing quality of life, uh, but with so much less washing machine. And what does that mean? That's so important because that means not only then we can save some energy and material, that we don't have to use, but also it means we don't have to spend time producing, selling, repairing, all of that, customer servicing, all of these extra washing machines. And so for me, that's when I talk about degrowth being a potential source of well-being. That's because producing less means we will be able to work less, which means we will liberate time to do whatever we want. Some of these stuff will be productive. Maybe you'll just start to pick up gardening. Maybe you'll join, you know, the community garden and just have fun doing that. Maybe you'll start uh, sewing your own clothes or maybe you'll just uh, spend time in the forest with your dog. Most likely, since you're going to be deciding what to do with your time, that's going to, you know, be more linked to your well-being than your current job, especially if you have not chosen it and that's a difficult job. So for me, I see that's a huge untapped source of energy today that we could unleash with a degrowth transition. And it would probably 
benefit our social relations as well. If I have to go in the basement uh, to do shared laundry is a good place to meet women or men and have a conversation, uh, et cetera, as, as one example. But we can imagine business as usual continuing for 10 or 20 or 30 years and all the deleterious impacts that that would have on the environment and, and society. Can you describe in a colorful, distinct way, the world that we would live in in 10 or 20 years under a best case scenario where degrowth ideas are adopted or at least proactively responded to globally? What does what our daily life look like different than today? Let's start with work because that's quite concrete. I mean, for most of us, it occupies most of our days. So you wake up early, you go to work, you do something that you're being told to do, and that's how you get your money. And with that money, you can go and buy stuff. And that stuff you can enjoy on the weekend with your family. So first, if we somehow work less, let's say divide working time by two, then it means there are going to be a lot more time. So your day is very unlike, we're not going to have these 40-hour shift. It's rather going to be like, well, you're going to work 16 hours a week. I know that might be shocking uh, <laughs> from a, a non-European perspective, even from a European perspective. But in the kind of modeling I do for France, we're talking about a 15 to 20 working hour week. So that's the amount of time you spend in your paid job. Might not be the best job in the world, but that's what you're doing pretty much as much as today, except it's a nice not-for-profit cooperatives where you can participate in decision-making, there's a nicer working conditions and all of that because there's no imperative to cut cost. So that's the thing. So we can collectively decide to afford to work nice, even if that means being slower, even if that means less productivity. You know, that means that people in a, in a warehouse, they're like, we don't want vo vocal control. We, we're going to take the time to have breaks. We want to be able to laugh and to discuss, even if that means, you know what, that it takes a bit more time. And instead of receiving your package in three days, you'll receive it in six days. But you know what? If we decide that's what we want, perhaps that's nice. So that's the first thing. And then you have all these available hours, which the way I imagine it, that's hours where we can create new extra economic institutions. I mean, often they call them commons. So commons is when we self-organize something. The Swedish washing machine. So for example, we have these washing machines, you have to decide of rules. Okay, how do we book it? All of these kind of social protocols. Same thing if you have a local currency or an object sharing network. These are very important. Same thing if you want to organize, you know, the sharing of uh, tools and, and, and books and anything like this. And so you organize this tool library or this repair cafes, bike kitchens, you know, they cook this fab lab, they're making hacker lab, many different little institutions. They're like businesses, but they're run by the, by the users. So they're just need focused. It's users coming together, pooling resources and using these resources to satisfy needs. So actually these are much more fitting to the definition of what an economy is for. An economy is, is here to satisfy needs while economic resources so we don't spend all our day working and producing stuff. We've forgotten that. Like, I want to measure the performance of a degrowth economy based on how much hours of undesired work it economizes every year. And every year, I want the prime minister to go on speech and be like, okay, guys, this year we went from, you know, 20 hours per week of non-chosen work, so the kind of stuff you have to do, to 18 and that's fantastic because now these two hours, you can do whatever you do, whatever you want. What we realize is when people do whatever they want, they don't just stay on the couch and watch TV. They go and talk to their neighbors. They do projects. They do science projects. They just innovate. They solve problems. So they actually just are much more, let's say, productive in a social, ecological, meaningful sense that if you just pay them to just do some telemarketing in a company that sells vacuums or connected fridges. Except right now, if we have two free hours, we probably will sit on the couch and go to Facebook or, or Instagram or something like that. So there would also have to be a cultural smorgasbord of new options for social recreation, interaction, et cetera. Completely. Now, like we are living in a cultural desert. I mean, unless you live in a very nice city and you have everything around you, if you're living in the suburbs, there, there's no much places to meet. But imagine how that could be different if, you know, we had 
all these little meeting spots. So for for retired people, for example, if people that are a bit on on the fringe of society, then you can hang out at the repair cafes. You know how to fix bikes. So you can show the youth, you know, I was part of a, a repair cafe in the southwest of France and you had a lot of retired people that would come and they would just love it. They would just hang out, chill, drink tea and just teach like youngster to how to repair their bikes. It's a win-win because youngsters, they don't know how to repair their bike. They don't have the money to go to a shop to repair the bike. So for me, that's like, that's the kind of stuff. And then you create a culture where, well, instead of staying at home and watching TV, and you know, spending an hour to pick which movie I want to watch on Netflix tonight, I'm going to go and hang out with the bike guys. You know, that's kind of fun. And then hanging out, you'd be like, well, you know what? We started a choir with a bike club, da da da, and we do all these things that all of us that resonates with what we're already doing today. And I think if you were to tell people, well, if we reduce the amount of stuff we produce and consume, so the commodities, this kind of monetary economy, you'll get more time to do that. I don't think a single person will be now. Nah, I'll take the connected fridge, or they're going to be very few. I so appreciate your enthusiasm and optimism on this. I'm going to push back on a couple things that yeah. I'm deeply concerned about and see what you think. So, three things. Um, you said that degrowth means less material throughput, but with well being, democracy, and less environmental pressures. Doesn't degrowth the way that I foresee it, which is an involuntary response to the inability of us to kick the can anymore, doesn't it imply more environmental pressures? For instance, uh, last week, Deutsche Bank did some scenarios that if the natural gas storage areas in Germany are not filled by this winter, and they won't be at least fully, then Germans are going to turn to forests and wood for heat in an increasing way. Same thing happened in Germany. I mean, in, in Greece, in the great financial crisis, they had to hire armed guards to protect people from taking down the forests in the north of Greece. So as we use less fossil fuels, either by a democratic choice or by we just can't afford them, won't there be increased environmental pressure as the default response? Well, I guess you said we need a new culture of consumption. This is why I said downscaling of production and consumption, because we need to move both in tandem. So the IPCC talking about sufficiency give you three famous examples. So people just going vegetarian, so reducing the amount of meat they, they eat, stop flying, you know, use your car less or even get rid of the car if you can, and, you know, renovate the way you heat your home. If we were all going to do that, we would just phase out most of the needs for fossil fuel. So let's think about this just as a thought experiment. So if now everyone in France at these nice little passive houses. We could have built because we know how to build them for decades. We don't do this because it's more expensive than just building this big cement structure. But that's we've only done that because this construction was handled by for-profit companies that were just cutting costs and trying to build as fast as possible to just make some money. If these had been organized as democratic, not-for-profit companies, of course, they would have been, yeah, we're going to be passive homes. It's badass. You build something and then it's environmentally neutral. You can even create some energy. If we had done this in the 90s or in the 70s when we've heard the Meadows, today, I mean, we would be completely energy sovereign. So look how much resilient that makes you. Then Russia say, okay, you know what? We stop exporting gas. And you're like, well, I don't care. I'll be able to heat my home like I, I do. So if if I think if we manage to act on demand, we can make ourselves much more resilient to a decrease in energy use, whether that is through collapse or through plant degrowth. I agree with the fact that in America, we use 100 times more energy than our bodies need. And in Europe, it's 50 times more. But what is the mechanism? Is it people like you acting as pilots and examples of living differently, and that becomes culturally acceptable, and there's a ground-up 
change in cultural priority or is it a top down the prices of social and environmental bads are doubled and tripled giving the better price signals on a conserving resources and innovating towards a resource constrained future is it top down or bottom mm. up or both both and there's like a triad of action i quite like and that's the ban i was thinking rationnement so rationing so you know either you ban something or you ration it or you tax it so for example now the numbers we have about commercial aviation shows that very few people take planes and that most of these flights are taken by very rich people so we could ban the expansion of airports straight away that's top down every time an airport wants to create a new lane they need to ask the government then the government says just no Sorry, we don't want to expand new lines. Actually, if you're running national lines that have strain alternatives, a time equivalent, well, you will have to close, shut down that line in X number of years, okay? So that's something you can ban, like the use of pesticides also. The EU now has just voted uh, banning a uh, fossil car, the selling of fossil car by 2035. So these kind of stuff, you can have top-down action to limit and then what you cannot ban, then you can ration. I mean, same thing for the plane tickets. If you think, you know, that uh, putting a tax on something is going to be unfair because in a high inequality environment, then the rich can maintain their lifestyle without too much of a, a loss, then you can just ration them in the same way that we already ration so many things like organs and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, when you queue to a shop, like these kind of things. So there's a variety of tools, full style quotas, flying quotas, where you can just ration. And then there's this variety of other tools in the box concerning taxes. So this sounds a lot like the uh, Klaus Schwab, a great reset. What, what do you think about that? Could you tell me a bit more about that? The kind of Davos crowd, uh, the World Economic Forum has something called the Great Reset, which mm -hmm. is that no one will own anything and everyone will be happy. And uh, it's a kind of a top down redistributive sort of a plan. I, I don't know the details, but I've read a little about it. I mean, the thing is, you can envision a couple of top down leverage point. And I, I like the concept of leverage point from Donella Meadows, uh, the main author of the Limits to Growth Report in the 70s, because I really feel that's our situation now. You know, the story of Aaron Ralston in the movie 127 Hours, you know, this hiker that was stuck his arm under a heavy rock in Moab. Oh, yeah. When hiking in the desert and got stuck like an idiot. That's us now. So we're stuck. And the only thing heavy that can lift the rock is some kind of state action because we're running against the power of corporations. So the state can use a bit of muscle power to lift the rock, but the state is not going to tell you where to go. That's where actually we connect to the new culture of consumption. People will have to just get together, reflect on their needs, create new patterns, you know, new ways of living, of working, of traveling. Does it have to be all states or can it be Denmark or France that takes the lead? Because it seems like if we're talking about a CO2 as a problem and the global environment, that one or two countries doing this won't be sufficient. Uh, what do you think about that? I mean, they're always front runners. If we come back to this, I, this uh, thought experiment about having passive homes and have reached energy sovereignty, I think every country now dreams of that. So we realized when New Zealand in 2019 ditches GDP and be now we're going to be measuring our public policy and our country's prosperity based on well-being budgets with you know 65 indicators of social health and ecological sustainability. They're not waiting to be like, oh, we need to agree at the level of the UN with everyone and convince that they're like, we're just going to do it because it's good for us and it's actually a responsible choice to do. So now I think I made a list of a lot of different countries moving in different directions. And I think countries learn from each other and said, oh, look what they did in New Zealand and we can try this. Look what they did in Norway, where they're just, you know, they have this kind of fee bait system to phase out heavy and polluting cars. And that France is like, oh, we had a fee bait too, but it was only for emissions. The Norwegian, they had it for the weight of the car. And so they managed to phase not only polluting cars, but also heavy cars, which are so much more uh, dependent on materials. So they managed to reduce not only carbon footprint, but also material footprint. Oh, nice. 
let's add this in. And then maybe at some point in other countries going to realize, look, in France, they just criminalized planned obsolescence since 2016. How did that go? What's going on? And then us in France, we're going to be, look, in Vienna, they, they don't have for-profit housing. It's all social housing. How does it work? Can we learn from that? So I think now it's just, we will never find the perfect country somewhere you know, in the ocean that has achieved that, the perfect utopia. It's going to be the messy work of looking at like what functions here and there and just making experiment to see what works. Is that a real example that France criminalized planned obsolescence? Yeah, it is. Well, I didn't know that. First country in the world to do that in 2016. But it's it's not been used because you know it's just the first time it's being legislated. So now the burden of proof is on consumers, and of course, good luck showing and bringing proof that Apple is doing planned obsolescence, where you know they're trying to disguise it. <laughs> right. So it's but it has led to a number of suing. So now consumers have been suing brands because they can with this law, and so I think at least in theory, and if that law is being improved to make sure it has teeth, companies are going to think twice before you know engaging in practices of planned obsolescence. And I mean, I give you another example I quite like. In Sweden, it's forbidden since the 90s to do advertising targeting children under 12. Mm. Just simple. Because they were like, okay, well, children, yeah, <laughs> there should be free of propaganda. Common sense to me. Common sense. Why is, is it the only country in the world to have done so? It's, it's, I we don't, don't know. Th that's the thing. Like, there are, there are hundreds. I'm actually gathering for a new book, a thousand of these nice little law or initiative that are existing in the world, that if we were to put together, we would get ourselves the perfect cocktail for a, a socially just and ecologically effective transition. I love that idea. I, I mean, I've been often in my public talks, I've said the worst invention of the human species is advertising and marketing. <laughs> I mean, imagine a world without it, seriously. So let me ask you a couple other constraints based on your optimistic vision of, of degrowth. Number one is if we look at a budget, an energy and material budget for, say, France, and you said earlier that France has more than enough energy and resources so that everyone can have a quality life with well-being. Uh, it's just the distribution is the problem. But then also you said that we have to have a global distribution to the global south. So where does the democracy find the appropriate level for the citizens of France, but then include things like what's happening in Sri Lanka or mm -hmm. other disadvantaged nations? Then do we take further haircuts of the people in France so that other people in other countries, and then where do we even draw the line there to other generations or even other species? I just don't see how that unfolds. Do you have any speculation on that? Yeah. I mean, we're already doing it through the United Nations with the, the COP climate conferences. You know, we agreed on it. The scientists, the IPC gives us a budget. Countries agreed on it. Then they each add to somehow design a plan to be, oh, I'm going to fit with that budget. And of course, in designing the budget in theory, and then of course, I'm going to tell you why it didn't work. Then the Global South was here defending their interests, being guys you know, stabilizing emissions is just not enough. We need you to go like twice as fast because we need more emissions now. And so in theory, we have the forum, we have the protocol, we've been doing this for several decades. Of course, there's a lot of interest running against this, but it's just a matter of doing the very same thing, not only for climate change, but for other global issues. So if we were to do this, then it's just the same thing. It's always the very messy process of of democracy, the same thing when you're living with a few people and you're deciding, you know, who's going to clean the kitchen, that's the same, uh, except it's just with countries. And if we want these countries' supranational discussions to be democratic, we also need to make sure that we have these democratic pockets within countries so that real interest of these people can just spring up. And so these people don't come to only represent the interest of the powerful, which are usually, you know, the industries that manage to lobby the government into doing what we've been doing during these negotiations. Each say, okay, we're going to cut that. And then you aggregate all the cut and you realize, well, that's not enough. That's so far from enough. I think we're going to see a small but important real world example of this in the coming months and years in Europe, where the pigs or the, the South in Europe, uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, 
especially with higher energy prices and what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, aren't going to fit all the EU standards to keep their debt to GDP uh, guaranteed and being purchased by the ECB. And, and so is are the Northern European countries going to willingly reduce their own living standards in order to support the Southern European peripheral countries? I don't know the answer to that, but mm. I, I think the G20, I think the leaders of the world cannot have the conversation that you and I are having because of loss aversion and the ubiquitous negative biological response humans have to less. And I agree with you that we can live happier lives with considerably less resources, especially those of us, you know, with resources living in, in the global North. But I don't think we're going to voluntarily choose that. And I think the biggest constraint that I can intellectually see in, in a smooth path to what you're proposing is the fact that in order to avoid a degrowth scenario, we are continually changing the rules and going to more and more debt. We're doubling our financial claims on reality globally every eight and a half years. And all those financial claims are someone or some country or some institution actually has a mental belief that they have access to a certain amount of future resources and it's a musical chairs situation. So I think degrowth will happen and it will be how our international community responds to this financial haircut that is imposed mm -hmm. upon us in the coming decade. My hope is that the work that you and others in the degrowth movement are doing can meet the future halfway and have these thousand ideas of the shared washing machines and the no advertising to kids under 12 and all the other things you're working on already starting to bleed into economies. So people have a foothold mm. in a different cultural path. Uh, do you have any comments to, to that as kind of a big statement? Yeah. It's, I mean, the idea of if it were the case as rich countries having to willingly decide to lower their standards of living, that would be a very difficult you know, sacrifice they will have to undergo. And then I would be quite pessimist. But they don't because, as I said, like they can produce and consume way less while increasing their quality of life. So this calculus we've done for France is if you bring people in the room, representative of the French population, and you ask them, what do you need every day? And they're going to make a list, you know, I need this and a house and a car and blah, blah, blah. Then you put money on that, right? And you estimate out cost where they live. And then you aggregate for the entirety of the population. You get one number. This is kind of the minimum national income you need to satisfy needs. And you can compare this to the actual national income you have. The difference right now this year is 44%. So we have a financial surplus of 44%. So in theory, if money was equitably distributed throughout France, we could lose 44% of our national income and no one would miss anything they need. It's not surprising. What we realized is actually wealth is concentrated, environmental pressures are concentrated. So I think in high-income countries, we could rather easily, if we were to have these big democratic discussions about what we need and ways of organizing our lives better so we can be happier while producing and consuming less, even just doing this will manage to free a lot of room and then if that's not enough, we get to the point you discussed. So once we've reduced 44% of the French monetary economy and all of these money, resources, energy becomes available to other countries, I mean, some of it obsolete being saved, if we need to do more, then we can discuss. But what I find surprising is we're not even willing to go that first leg of the way. What I'm arguing right now is let's go the first leg of the lay of the first leg of the of the journey and that let's let's see. But then I want to I want to play with another idea that um, anthropologist Jason Hickel have uh, developed recently. Most of the resources, the energy and the materials we use, they they're not mined, extracted on national territory. We import them from the global south. So now for a very long time, economists have been just legitimating globalization and international trade using dubious theories that shows that somehow they benefit from that. I mean, comes an energy crisis and you realize 
that regardless of the amount of money you have, that's gonna not going to make up for that. Same for a food crisis. There's food scarcity is the one that can grow food that is rich, not the one that's got a lot of money. So what about the scenario where the global South actually just create coalition like the African Union and regional coalition and decide, you know what, now we're going to stop exporting our resources. We're going to use these resources for our own development. And then, then we realize that they have the bargaining power. So I know that's just a naive thought experiment, but if we believe that somehow every economic activity is dependent on energy and material, if these is really the core source of value, then that makes these countries today uh, very powerful uh, for certain materials that they have. Well, energy material is the core source of wealth other than ecosystem functioning ecosystems that are healthy and, and vibrant. Well, I really hope you can continue to expand thinking and examples on how we're going to have to live with less energy materials. I'm going to now, if it's okay with you, ask you some personal questions that I ask at the end of uh, every interview to sure. all my guests. So given everything that you've said, do you have any specific suggestions for how individual people listening to this podcast in advanced economies today can prepare themselves and their communities for what I call the great simplification and what you refer to as, as degrowth. Inform yourself a few years back, that will have been very difficult to find information on this. Now there's just plenty of good quality books plenty of podcasts, your documentary, all these wonderful sources that give you access to an information that was just not available before. And so that's first, like get that information and then go in discussing it. So I want to hear to give like empower yourself to enter these discussions. Very often, you know, people, when they meet you, they're like, oh, I'm not an economist and I, I haven't read your 900 pages thesis. So I'm like, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, if we, if any single discussion about the future of humanity is just among people that have a Nobel Prize in economics, which have so far just advocated, we keep doing what we're doing, uh, <laughs> there's going to be a problem. <laughs> so I think people like get some information and don't wait to have a PhD in something, to have a conversation. If you feel there's something wrong and you want to get to the bottom of them, ask questions, get to know the people that work on that, uh, get in touch with people. I've been doing that since the beginning of my studies. When I want to know something, I just get to that person and ask in the most naive, candid manner. You know, let it be just the head of a investment fund, uh, a sociologist, or, you know, anyone. Just go ask them directly. Don't go around, don't beat around the bush. Ask what you want. Usually it works. So you are a recently minted PhD student. What recommendations do you have specifically for young humans who become aware of the energy environment and biophysical constraints to the, the current human situation? Maybe just, it's an emotional shock. So a lot of my colleagues, they suffer from eco-anxiety, I mean, it's a pretty dismal job. You know, every I spend my days just reading reports about how the world is burning. So it's just after a while, that's terrifying. It gets more and more terrifying, but it's nothing compared to the terror of when you first become aware that there's something wrong. It's like the Matrix when Neo just sees, you know, the human being used as batteries and he's like, wow. So don't do that alone. There are so many people now that are doing this. So again, like get in touch, create a book club. Something as simple as that, something a wealth that is not including in GDP, but just book clubs where you can discuss, when you can support each other, uh, when you can empower yourself as a group to get to learn more about these ideas that are terrifying and sometimes complicated. I'm friends with numerous uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, and one of the universal things that they tell me is if you're anxious about some global issue, just talk to someone else about it. And even if neither of you or none of the people in the conversation have any answers, it's the mere fact of sharing with another human your thoughts and your concerns and your anxiety and your hopes that it reduces the cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and it boosts helper T cells, which are good for your immune system. So I agree with you mm. that just conversations mm. are, are a big help. Uh, so Tim, what do you care 
personally? What do you care most about in the world? Okay, now I'm going to surprise you because my answer is a bit silly. What I care most about in the world is footnotes. <laughs> okay, that that did surprise me. Uh, yeah, you, you were not expecting for that one. So the, the thing is, I'm a huge academic writing nerd. If I'm studying economics, climate change, all of that, it's not because I love it. It's because we need to do that. Otherwise, you know, there, there won't be a planet where we can write nice, nice texts and everything. But that's, that's to show that for me, I'm not doing this out of pleasure. If we were living in a world that is not burning, where everything is pretty much stabilized, I would not be an economist. I would be philosopher of science and I would study what happens in a text when you create a footnote. Uh, that kind of very, you know, you have nerdy books about this, the use of the comma, the use of the bracket. What happens when you put a bracket in a footnote? Inception style. It's a thought within a thought within a thought. So these kind of very fun questions. Um, so that's what I care about. That's the thing I don't care about. Like I have, we are forced to care about inequality and poverty and the destruction of natural habitat because it's happening. And that's also another thing that's just like solving these problems will also allow us to concentrate on other things. Hopefully, you know, that's just a transition. We focus a big time in dealing with that. And then I can just, you know, read books about academic writing on my hammock in the park. So I appreciate and share your reverence for footnotes and science, which underpins them. I worry, though, that what actually is behind the footnotes is becoming increasingly watered down on the science itself and also increasingly less paid attention to as polarization and other anxieties and worries for our population trump uh, what mm. 20, 30 years ago would have been like really solid mm. science. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, there's there's many things going on there. At the very core level, the application or for-profit mentality to the world of science. So now science being drawn into so many just articles being produced. So we're applying the kind of logic of growth and the definition of performance to the way we do science. With Again, that science has never been a bit quantity. It's always a bit quality. It's always concrete about answering problems. And then, of course, the financing of that science come to reflect certain problems. So geologists, they're going to be spending time trying to locate new oil fields more than they're going to be spending time trying to find ways of closing them, of course, because the financing goes uh, one way. And then, as you said, once you've produced the science, there is like a whole course of obstacles for that science to be listened to. I mean, look at the IPCC. I mean, it's their sixth report. They took like eight years to write the last one. It's the most, it's the biggest scientific enterprise in the history of our species. And even that, people will be like denying that. And yesterday, the New York Times did a survey that only 1% of Americans and 3% of Democrats consider climate change the most important issue today. The number one was uh, inflation followed by economy and like 26% or something like that. Wow. Yeah. So what are you personally, out of all the issues that you mentioned and maybe some others, what are you personally most concerned about in the coming decade or so in our world? Biodiversity. I mean, in studying the natural world, I think the amount of terror I've got facing a climate collapse is nothing compared to how fearful I am towards a collapse of biodiversity. So a world without fish, without insect, without forest, without trees, without microorganisms in the soil. I mean, imagine all, like, all of that. There is no, we don't know how to create ecosystems. We don't know. We, we only know a small percentage of all the species that exist on Earth. We don't know how they work. We don't even know they exist, but we know how to destroy them. But we have no clue what will happen once this is gone. I think the pandemic is showing us uh, how violently nature, a nature we don't understand can bite back. And so, you know, the future viruses are just, you know, getting used to growing food without pollinators or realizing, you know, that the spread of diseases happens so much faster when some insect disappears. All of these kind of 
feedbacks. They terrify me. This is why for me, like as an ecological economist, I see nature as a very sophisticated uh, economy of its own that has been developing for millions of years, even more. And we don't understand how the bumblebee can fly. We don't understand how bees organize. And so don't tell me we're going to just pollinate flowers with drones. No. I mean, that would be like such an inefficient and stupid way of going. Like the way of going would be to just protect the bees and let them do what they do best. I share your fear for that. We will miss them when they're gone. And if you followed my work at all, you know that the thing that I find most sacred in our world is the natural world and the species we share the planet with. And we just don't include them in our decisions. I think it's starting to change very, very slowly. So in contrast, Tim, uh, what are you most hopeful about in the coming decade or so? Okay, uh, this, this I love. Perhaps you've heard about the different calls for desertion uh, among French graduates. No, I have not. That has been this spring. Oh, that's fun. So big engineers, top engineer business schools, they graduate. And then on their graduation speech, they just announced like, you know what? We won't participate in the massacre. We've been trained to build highways, to extract oil, but we won't do it. And we're inviting you to desert capitalism, to build that society we want to apply our energy, our intelligence, our creative forces into building the society we want. And so in France, it's calls for desertion. Uh, I mean, in China, it was the lying flat movement starting in June 21. Same kind of move. Like we're just our generation. There's no money you can give us that's going to make us destroy the world. Like, especially now that we know that, you know, money doesn't make you happy. What we want is meaning. What we want is a feeling to improve the world. And when you think about it, that is just as a huge transformatory, transformational potential. If every single time you want to open an oil field or, you know, build a private jet, you cannot find an engineer that will do it because they'll just laugh at you and be like, what? build a private jet? Do you think I've got that, only that to do? I'm just doing so, you know, and then you won't be able to do it. So this kind of like general strike, but striking against capitalism is a story of a transformation I, I rather like. I think there's parallel strike that's happening in China right now, which is people are not paying their mortgages because mm -hmm. they don't believe in the system and they're having to pay for things that that aren't even being built yet. And the whole property bubble is has exploded. So I think there's a complexity risk associated with that. But I do actually agree with you that there will be emergent social responses like the one you're discussing that we can't even imagine yet that are going to play a role in our future. So Timote, if you were benevolent dictator, which is not a completely remote possibility one day, <laughs> and there was no personal recourse to your decisions, oh, what one thing would you do to improve human and planetary futures? What one thing would you enact? I would eradicate extreme wealth. As simple okay. as that, I would just take all the wealth we have in all its various forms. And I would just split it up equitably, not fully equally, but equitably in, be in between people of the world. It's not going to solve all problems, but at least it will give us a fresh start where we all have an equal say. But wouldn't that everything else be an equal if we had the same rules and the same energy surplus eventually just following a power law get to the same place it was other than the fresh start part of it? I mean, I do hope that we've learned from the mistake of the past. I don't think there will be, you know, there's no miracles, no easy shots. We need to learn from the mistake we've made and we need to make better decisions. But no one is going to do that for us. And, you know, isn't, there's nothing guarantee we succeed. And that's also good. We need to be aware that we can fail because that means we are humble and we think twice about before taking an action. You are a bright, creative young human. I wish there were more uh, people like you. Do you have any other closing thoughts, advice, wisdom for the listeners of this show? Thank you, Nate. I'm, I'm, I'm honored. If you've listened until now, I'm, uh, I'm wishing you the best. And I hope our uh, path 
Cross, all of you. Okay, mon ami, to mm. be continued. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. If you enjoyed or learned from this episode of The Great Simplification, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases. 